So over the past five or six years, um, I've deployed a little over 170 bat houses across eastern Ontario. Uh, and in addition, individual landowners independent of my project have put up some of their own. Uh, this is actually a combination. Uh, this is a style of bat house called a rocket box. It's not the style I typically build, uh, but these landowners here had a rocket box. It's starting to get a little bit old and breaking apart. So I put up a, a separate one right beside it and the bats are starting to move into the new bat house, but a few are still in the old um, bat house. And uh, I'm just gonna check to see if these bat houses are occupied. And if they're occupied, we're gonna try to catch some bats, put some radio transmitters. Um, this bat's roost is well protected because um, the, uh, the landowners here love their bats and their bat house. Um, and so this roost is protected, but we also want to see where they're feeding and getting their insects uh, so that those sites can be protected as well. So we're going to put miniature radio transmitters on them tonight and uh, we're going to watch that live on Facebook. Oh yeah, and this is full and there's lots of bats in the old one and I think there's a few in the new one too. Yeah, so lots of bats. So I'm going to stop shining the light on them now and um, let them uh, have some peace um, so that they're willing to come out on time. You can actually see the size of the colony by this massive accumulation of bat guano at the base of the pole here. So this is called a mist net, and if you're having trouble seeing it, that's the whole point. It's fine like the mist, and, um, and so it's a very fine net. Uh, bird biologists, ornithologists use the same kind of net to capture uh, birds and so the bat will um, fly into the net. Uh, the, it has these kind of pockets. The bat will get caught between the pockets. I'll um, rush in, remove it from the net uh, and we'll put it in a soft, breathable, dark cloth bag and uh, leave it in that holding bag until we're ready to weigh it, measure it. And uh, usually the bats are in the net, out of the net, and have a radio transmitter on uh, within less than 30 minutes and often within 10 minutes. And that's what our, our goal is to get the bats back to being free to do what they need to do as quickly as possible. This time of year, um, we'll be catching lactating females. And so uh, they need to go out and feed and then come back to feed their young. So it's, it's June 21st, so we're right at the, uh, um, the beginning of summer with the longest days. So these bats are probably going to start emerging sometime between 9.15 and 9.30. And um, it's about quarter to nine right now. So um, while we're waiting for the bats to start emerging, uh, we've already set a net. And uh, you'll see the net in a minute. So I'm just going to get organized here. Um, each bat we catch, we're going to weigh it. I'm going to measure its forearm size. Bats eat a tremendous amount of food each night. Uh, in some cases, 50 to 100% of their body weight. So that would be like me eating over a thousand Big Macs. So they're really packing on the insects. And that means their weight fluctuates quite a bit. So when we're studying fish, we often use body mass as a relative measure of size, uh, but that doesn't work so well with bats because if you catch one at four in the morning after it's been feeding all night, it's gonna be very much heavier than uh, when it emerges after a day of uh, roosting and digesting its food. So we use forearm length as a standard way to measure bat um, size. So I'm going to get some calipers um, out. I'm also going to get some equipment um, to attach a radio transmitter. So we're going to track these bats using these really small radio transmitters here. Um, and um, we've just activated them. We've turned them on by soldering the lead wires together. They're so small and they need to be so light because the bats are very small. So we can't even have things like switches on these um, transmitters. We activate them by um, taking a soldering iron uh, and some solder and soldering the leads together. We've already activated four um, because I'm definitely expecting to catch at least four of them. And each of these radio transmitters has a different frequency. 
just like for any people who still listen to old school radio, you tune into your rap station or your classic rock or your news station, um, depending on what station you want to listen to. So each of these transmitters broadcasts at a different frequency, just the way a radio station or a TV station does. And so we will tune to this particular radio frequency um, and we will scan and that will tell us if the bat wearing this transmitter is nearby or not. Um, and the transmitters do two things. As I just described, they help us figure out where the bats are, and you'll see these radio receivers that we use to track them. Uh, but the second thing they do is they allow us to measure the body temperature, the skin temperature of the bats. One of the things we need to know as the climate is warming is are some bat houses getting too hot for the bats? And so in the daytime, we're gonna go and we're gonna measure the bat's body temperature also using these transmitters. So the warmer the bat's skin is, the more quickly the pulses, uh, the radio pulses, the beeps that we hear in our radio are produced. And for each transmitter, we have a graph and we can read the pulse rate or the interpulse interval, the number of milliseconds between two beeps. And we read that off a graph and that tells us exactly what the bat's skin temperature is. So we wanna know, we, for years we've been saying, put bat houses where uh, they get nice and warm, especially in the early morning. Uh, now we're a little bit worried as the climate is changing that maybe those recommendations have to be fine-tuned and altered a little bit to reflect the warmer weather we've, um, we've been having the past few summers. So that's another part of this uh, radio tracking project we're working on. So we're almost finished putting the net away um, and then the rest of this cleanup we'll do later. Um, once the net's taken care of, we'll move to the processing station that I set up earlier and we're going to take some basic measurements. We're going to determine whether the bats are young bats born this year or adults. We can't age bats, but we can distinguish newborns from adults and I'll show you how we do that. And then I'm going to clip a little fur sample so that I can get some bare skin to glue a radio transmitter. We use surgical glue that is meant for gluing to skin. And uh, the fur we remove to attach the radio transmitter to get that patch of bare skin, I will also keep and use to analyze for various contaminants, especially mercury, which for completely unexplained reason is way higher than it should be in bats based on where bats uh, live in the environment and where they fit in in the food web. And if anyone's interested in the more scientific details of that story, um, there's a, a talk on YouTube that I've done about the science uh, to a group of scientists, which I can direct you to. You can just contact me or one of my crew at the River Institute if you want to know where to find that. All right, so we got the net taken care of. Now we'll bats in the capture order so that they're um, so that I don't end up having the first bat captured being the last bat released because then it would be in captivity for the better part of an hour. I like to try to make the time from capture to release if I can. I like to make it half an hour or even less if possible. So Weigh this bat. So 
So right now, Brian, you're just measuring the bag. Uh, yeah, weight. I'm just subtracting the weight of the bag. I'm zeroing the balance with the weight of the bag already on there, and it's very windy. I might have trouble with the balance. Error. Meanwhile, I'll get my good idea. So Lexi's gonna try to make a wind break for me. So I'm recording where I'm capturing these, um, the species I've captured. So this is a little brown bat, Myotis lucifugus. It's a female bat. Bats are mammals, so we tell the difference between males and females the same way we would with people. You can find other YouTube or Facebook videos on how to do that, I'm sure. <laughs> I will not explain it. So while we're doing that, I'm going to see whether it's an adult or a young. Even though, because of the time of year, I can probably tell that. So what I'm doing is I'm taking its wing, and its wing bones are actually its finger bones. Bats have hands that look just like a human hand, except that the fingers are really long, and that's what supports the wing membrane, those fine finger bones. And I'm going to shine my light through its what would be its knuckles into my eyes. And what I'm looking for is clear lines of cartilage. So bone starts out as cartilage in mammals, and the bone gradually becomes ossified, which means the cartilage becomes replaced by bone. And when that process is finished, bones no longer grow anymore. And what is sometimes called in everyday language, the growth plate appears as a clear, translucent, transparent line. And so I didn't see that clear line, so which means this bat is fully grown, which means it's an adult. We can't tell how old they are. We can only tell whether they're adults or young. We can only estimate ages by banding bats when they're young and then recapturing them at a later date. So this bat is 7.58 grams. So these bats are very tiny and that's an adult. This is 7.58. Yeah. Sorry, during my walk, you cut out when you said that. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, we just let you know that we still have the signal of the bat. Um, we have to find it in the Can you tell if it's downstream or upstream? Oh, that's awesome. Just keep monitoring that behavior and documenting it every five or ten minutes. Okay, great. So if you could just keep monitoring that behavior and documenting every five to ten minutes, that'd be good. No problem. All right, so, and it's a lactating female, so um, this won't show up, I don't think, on the camera, but I can see little bare patches right where its nipples would be, which you're not, I don't think, going to see because it's too squirmy, 
um, and but the fur is chewed away around the bat's nipples so it's a lactating female which is exactly what we expect this time of year now measure its forearm so body mass because bats eat so much their their body mass fluctuates really really widely so a better measure of size is its forearm length so you know how to read a vernier scale let's see or okay. As we said earlier, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the comments section of the of the video, and we'll answer them as so we go. Now I'm going to get a first sample, and I'm going to use that first sample to analyze its mercury concentration. So I want 19 up there. So. Take a little bit of fur right from the area between the shoulder blades and that's where I'm going to attach the radio transmitter and I just want to get enough I want to get close enough to the skin so that the transmitter can be bonded to the skin so that it's not flapping around and pulling on the back skin it'll be as a more comfortable fit This mayfly made the mistake of <laughs> stopping on my hand, so I'm just going to feed him to this bat, give the bat a little snack as a thank you for tolerating me. And eat the rest of it. All right, I'm going to clip a little bit more fur. Getting pretty close to enough here. A little bit more on this side. So these transmitters weigh less than 0.4 grams with the glue that I'm going to add to it and everything included.
So I'm writing down the radio frequency, the channel of this bat. And I'm going to need a helper for this part. So just open that. And just take the brush and basically paint the um, flat side, that side there. Just paint the transmitter for me. There'll be a brush on the end. And uh, you don't need to be delicate, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but I can um, wipe off the excess. So now, I'm just going to get a better hold of the bat. How long does that take to dry, um, Well, I'm going to leave it for just a few minutes. It won't fully dry for quite a while. I'm not even sure how long it takes, but I try to keep him in my hand like this now for about five minutes. Um, now, In that yellow toolbox, can someone just move that bat detector and flip that toolbox up? And there's a little bit of super glue. Um, well, maybe it's, is there super glue in there? Oh, there it is. Sorry, wrong toolbox. Just get the tube of super glue out. And can you just unscrew the cap? Now this I'm not putting on the bat, I'm just, I'm putting a little bit of extra reinforcement on the, um, the leads of the uh, transmitter, which I forgot to do earlier. And so the, the, the transmitter is um, soldered, but I'm just putting a little bit of extra glue on along with the solder. And that also helps waterproof the, the connection a little bit. And so now he's ready to be released. All right, well, welcome everyone. Yeah, so we're gonna bring you into the field with us as best we can um, uh, to show you um, close up the work we're doing to try to conserve little brown bat populations. If you've heard from me in recent years, you've probably heard about the massive population decline. Little brown bats are now considered uh, an endangered species. The good news is some of the work we've been doing here at the River Institute is helping those populations recovered. We've uh, put up, uh, built and deployed more than 170 roosting boxes. Several of these boxes have bats in them. Uh, we captured some bats out of bat box on Monday. We put radio transmitters on them. Uh, in addition to those four, we've got another uh, eight bats with radio transmitters. And we're gonna be looking um, for those bats tonight. So before, I joined you, or before you joined me, I guess, really, um, I located all but one of them, and um, they are roosting right now close to where we caught them uh, in the Williamstown area, uh, but one of them is missing, and so I'm using this telemetry radio, uh, which will pick up the signal of the transmitter. Each, each bat has a different frequency, the same way a radio station has a different frequency so that you can listen to your favorite rap music or country music or the CBC news by changing the dial. So I'm tuned to the one bat 
that I haven't found yet. And I have a bat roosting box here. We're at Cooper Marsh. If you, uh, it might be too dark to recognize where we are, but we're at Cooper Marsh. And I have a bat house here. And uh, I'm going to see if that missing bat is here. The reason we're here is that we've actually got some of the bats that we've tracked in the last couple of nights. They're roosting in bat houses near Williamstown, but they're heading south towards the St. Lawrence River uh, to feed. Several of them seem to be feeding on the Raisin River, right near where their bat houses are, right near where their day roosts are, but at least one of them consistently heads towards uh, uh, Charlottenburg Park, Co Cooper Marsh area. We've detected it on Fraser Road. Um, so it doesn't look like it's here right now. Um, and um, if the bats behave and fly by, um, we will hear um, a ticking sound and that alerts us to the fact that bats are flying. And of course, because I'm trying to show you that sound, there are no bats flying right now. Um, so um, our original plan, Emma, you might as well just follow, uh, follow us um, because the um, bat house um, definitely doesn't oh, have the go. bat we're listening uh, for, the bat with the radio transmitter. So that little clipping sound you're hearing coming out of the bat detector that Emma's holding, That's, um, that's a bat. Um, we don't hear their echolocation calls. The bat detectors pick up the echolocation calls and they replay it at a lower frequency, a lower pitch. Uh, pitch is the uh, frequency is how we measure pitch. Uh, so it's high pitch, too high for our ears. Um, the, um, uh, the sound gets replayed at a lower frequency. So we know there are bats. We can also, to some extent, um, identify species by the sounds and the frequency we have the bat detector tuned to. Um, and um, I was busy with other things. I wasn't focusing on that sound. I think that was probably a hoary bat we were hearing uh, and a big brown bat we were hearing. Uh, haven't heard any little brown bats yet. So now we're going to walk out onto one of the trails. And on this trail, uh, just a few uh, meters away from the uh, beginning of the trail, there's an observation blind that birders use, and it gives a great view of the open water part of the marsh. And I've deployed bat detectors that are very different from the one that Emma's using, bat detectors that record and store all of the calls of all the bats that fly by. And I know from analyzing that data that there are large numbers of little brown bats this summer using this area. And um, I, there are no little brown bat roosts, day resting places that I know of nearby. So I'm hoping that all of those bats that I'm hearing are some of the bats we tagged in Williamstown. And when you get to the fork, we're going to go to the right here. And I might actually not see the fork because the camera light is in my eyes and I'm not seeing very well. So don't let us walk past the fork, someone who's uh, not directly in the camera light. Is this it? This way, right here, Doc. This oh, right here. here. It's a challenge to do biological research in the dark and it's an even bigger challenge to live stream it at the same time but we're doing our best so bear with us so this is another bat detector and this is the type of bat detector I was speaking about earlier so we're not going to hear any ticking sounds like we heard on the other detector. Uh, it has no um, speaker to broadcast the sounds it's picking up. The microphone is hanging out over the window opening here. And uh, 
the sounds are being stored on a memory card. And so I'll only get to know what uh, the microphone detects when I go and analyze that data in the daytime on my computer using some specialized software. So we're going to leave this bat detector here for a couple of hours. We're going to leave with you guys following and then after this event is over I'm going to come back here, collect it, I'm going to leave it on for two hours. That will give me a sense of what species are using this habitat. So a minute ago I was just I had my radio tuned to one particular bat. The only bat we haven't been able to find of those bats we tagged in Williamstown. We've tagged a total of eight, including the four we did on Monday. Uh, we found seven, one's missing. I confirmed that it's not in my bat house here at Cooper Marsh. So now I'm going to change the mode of this radio and I'm going to stick the radio right up here. And I'm going to listen to it for about just a couple of minutes. And it's going to automatically scan through 12 different bats. The eight that I have from Williamstown plus four from uh, St. Andrews. And every once in a while you get some electrical interference from other electronic stuff. It might even be a camera that we're using to... Uh, to stream this. Um, so every five seconds I don't need to um, do anything myself. It's pre-programmed. I did that before we arrived here and it's scanning. It's changing frequencies every five seconds and so within less than a minute we'll have scanned through all of those uh, bots that I'm trying to find. And um, after the streaming uh, with you guys is over uh, we're going to come back here and spend more time listening at Cooper Marsh. One of my crew members is in St. Andrews and she's on a, at a riverside property sitting on a, a, a deck that um, looks out over the Raisin River closer to the St. Andrews bats that we tagged. So nothing, nothing here yet. Um, if bats were leaving and coming directly here from where we tagged them in Williamstown, um, they'll probably be here soon. I can hear there's lots of bats um, flying out here because I can hear Emma's bat detector uh, that she still got on uh, behind me. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, we're going to uh, walk back. To the visitor center uh, where our vehicles are parked. We're going to hop on, uh, hop in those vehicles and we're going to take you with us on the road. Um, if you have any questions you can ask them along the way. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go on a very short drive to um, Fraser Road because my crew has found one of the bats feeding consistently at that site. We're going to stop there and uh, we're going to see if we can find one of the bats with a radio transmitter on them. Um, and uh, and then we'll say goodbye um, after that and um, I'll be continuing to do this for uh, the rest of the night um, until about probably one or two o'clock uh, in the morning. Uh, one of the things I find frustrating is people get a real misconception about what biology is all about uh, because so many documentaries take a lifetime of exciting moments and they pack it into an hour. Uh, science is definitely for me exciting but it also requires some patience. Finding these bats, um, is a, and especially when they're out feeding and they could be going anywhere, is really like looking for that proverbial needle in a haystack, um, except it's even harder because they're flying. The haystack is always changing locations. Uh, but despite that, uh, uh, with a great crew, we've been able to track down and locate several feeding areas, and uh, hopefully we'll have some luck while you're following us. So I'm going to pack up my receiver and we're going to head back to the car and we're going to head to a site where we found one of our bats the last two nights. So I'm going to take this uh, omnidirectional antenna off my radio. I've got, um, I've got another antenna strapped to the roof rack of this car. And uh, I'm just going to plug into this 
um, as we're driving and I'm going to scan as we drive and Zach's going to hop in the uh, car with me so that you can uh, continue to follow along and we'll have another person in the back seat monitoring uh, questions. Alright, so now we make sure the radio is still scanning. It is. So we're just pulling out of Cooper Marsh. And um, so this bat that we're looking for, it's a bat that uh, was tagged either in the bat house where we live streamed from um, on Monday or from one very, very close. And that was in the Williamstown area. Um, and uh, just a, a few uh, hundred meters from the town and um, it's come all the way down to Fraser uh, Road south of the 401 so that's a distance of um, several kilometers which is interesting because you would think there's all kinds of insects right on the Raisin River right near where the bats roost during the day but for some reason one of them um, at least two nights in a row has decided to come down in this direction. The other thing we're learning about these bats is they do a lot of roost switching and the bats that we're tagging these are pregnant uh, these are lactating females in most cases at this time of year so they're nursing their young uh, yet they're doing a lot of moving from one bat house to another all in the Williamstown area for the most part um, and that requires uh, picking up their young and flying with their young and relocating so bats um, seem to do quite a bit more roost switching than we expected um, and I think other researchers who are do doing similar kinds of things have been finding um, similar similar results that these little brown bats do more roost switching than we, um, we would have thought all right, I think I cut out for a bit, but uh, found Fraser Road, and um, if I'm lucky and there's no cars behind me, I'm going to just go nice and slowly, maximize our chance of picking up a signal. So this is a um, this is a site that I've never um, uh, been to to find this bat. It was my crew a couple of nights ago, and then again last night that found this bat out here. So I'm excited to see this uh, spot for myself. But at least one of the bats seems to be consistent. It comes here and it stays for a little while. If we're lucky, we'll um, we'll overlap with it and. Um, if, um, if I don't detect it, I'll just keep heading towards where these, the majority of these bats are roosting and uh, maybe we'll find some from new sites. And that's really what these, uh, this field work involves. It's a lot of um, just searching and hoping to find signals. And uh, this has been a good day. Out of the total of 12 bats, I have radio transmitters on. Um, we found uh, nine of those 12. And, um, it's hard to tell in the dark, but we seem to be right beside an agricultural field. And there's, um, uh, on the far side of that agricultural field, there's a row of trees. And um, on the driver's side of the car, there's a row of trees um, right beside me. And uh, rows of trees often. Oh, there we go. We got it. So I'm just going to, um, so the si we, we got a signal and then it stopped. That's just because the uh, radio receiver moved on to the next frequency. So I'm going to put it into a different mode here. And I'm going to scan through the channels until I see which one it is. I'm expecting it to be channel 4. There we go. I'll turn up the volume. Down. 
So I don't know how well the, uh, the sound of the signal um, comes across, but what I'm detecting now is I've lost the signal. Now it's come back very, very faintly. I'm going to pull off the road a little bit here. So that cars can uh, safely get by me. I'm going to put my signal lights on. And so that tells me this bat is flying. So if it was roosting, that signal that I picked up would have stayed uh, and it would have just continued beeping at a steady volume. But it disappeared completely, then it came back faintly. Um, a few seconds ago it was really loud. And so that's a sign that the bat's um, feeding. So um, I'm just um, in a minute here um, going to uh, get out and take the radio antenna off and it looks like the car that's behind me um, is the rest of my crew so just be careful getting out of the car so a couple of safety things um, um, when um, look carefully before you get out of the car and we're gonna go in front of the cars not behind the car so if anyone is on this road and falls asleep or is driving impaired we have the cars to protect us and uh, we're gonna stay right off the road and get right into the ditch if we can uh, to be um, even though this is not a busy road um, it is it is late at night When I attached this antenna to my car, I wasn't thinking about having to take it off. <laughs> so it's really well tied because I didn't want it to rattle around and, uh, and scratch the roof of the car. Okay, someone's helping me on the other side. And that one, I'll let you hang on to that radio. If you hear a signal, Emma, from the radio, let me know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, the rope's still tied, but. Okay. Yeah, it's oh, perfect. Alright. So just let's get in front of the car so that we can protect one of the cars from uh, any potential falling asleep drivers or impaired drivers, which sadly is something we have to worry about when you're doing nighttime field work. So um, now that I'm out of the car um, and the metal roof rack is not touching the antenna, I should get better reception, but I'm, I've already lost that bat. And that's happened three nights in a row when my crew found it, they found it, and then it disappeared. So it's a little bit like um, you know putting together uh, pieces of a puzzle, it's detective work, so I have to think you know what that means. So, First thing that's coming to my mind is they lived during the day, this particular bat was in Williamstown at five or six o'clock before dark when I was on my way to Cooper Marsh to start this live stream. Now, just a few minutes ago, I got a signal and it very quickly disappeared. So the bat's flying south. If I was a bat, um, I'd be going to Cooper Marsh where all that wonderful wetland is producing all sorts of aquatic insects. So. Um, my original plan was to keep making my way back towards 
Williamstown where these bats spend the daytime, but I think instead, because this has happened three days in a row, I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna go back to Cooper Marsh and I'm just gonna sit um, in that bird blind where we started the live stream uh, um, and uh, listen all night long, see if maybe some of the other bats are doing the same thing. And is there, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, yep. ask. And I'll also be back another day with uh, out all the challenges of working in the dark with a cell phone and a signal that may or may not be reliable. But you know, at my desk at home, uh, where you can ask me some more detailed questions if you're interested. And, and that date's going to be coming up in July. Uh, check the River Institute website for for details or get in touch with the River Report team, which can also be done through our, our website. There does appear to be some questions. All right. Yeah, there is a, I don't know if it's so much of a question as a comment, but someone said, I live along a PSW forested swamp along the Beaudet. I would love to track nest and feeding populations along the edge. So um, send me um, an email um, and um, say that you are the person who asked the question. Um, the Bodet River is a place that I have no data from but would love to get data from. So I will bring that bat detector that we showed you uh, that we left behind at Cooper Marsh and we'll go pick up later. Um, I'd be super happy to um, uh, set that up on your property and uh, get back to you with what species you have using that property. And where can we find your email, Brian? So um, my email uh, is bats at riverinstitute.ca. You don't even have to remember my name. <laughs> Perfect. So is there any other questions? This would be a great time. Oh, there's one by Tara. How big is the colony that this bat you're tracking is part of? So um, it, what, one of the things we're learning, so there are five different, uh, four different bat houses, all in generally in the Williamstown area. And it seems to be that that is actually one colony and they move from bat house to bat house, maybe depending on temperature, maybe depending on pr disturbances that happen and they uh, try to keep predators guessing. Um, so the whole colony combined is uh, probably about 200 or more bats. Uh, the individual bat houses, one of them alone has more than 100 bats. And the others are like 40, 50, 60 at least. So yeah, it's, so really good news that uh, because that uh, was a species that many people thought was on its way to extinction. The uh, population decline that I referred to earlier was over 90% decline in population which might make it one of the biggest population crashes since biologists have been trying to detect and um, prevent those things. All right, well, thanks those who um, joined us. I'm gonna head back to Cooper Marsh and uh, get prepared for a long night in that uh, duck blind. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And if you are interested in, if you are interested in listening or seeing any more workshops. We're going to be running them for the next couple of months and you can go to the Great River Report website and all of our workshops will be linked there. The recordings of the live workshops will all be posted there. So thanks again for tuning in.